All right, boys and girls, this is Daniel, and in this video, we're going to start diving into the object oriented paradigm in Scala. Now, object orientation is a little bit different in Scala than in other languages, so make sure you go through this section very carefully because it will influence basically the entire code that you will ever write. All right, we're back to the IDE, and for this section, we're going to create a new package in which we will store the applications that we're going to write for every lecture. But I want you to be very careful in the next couple of seconds so that you don't mess up your package structure. So I want you to go to the source folder and right click here instead of the lectures package. I want you to go ahead and click on new package and call this lectures dot part two OOP, then hit OK. So notice that the structure here has changed. In the lectures package, we have two sub packages, the part one basics that we completed in the previous section and the part two OOP that we're going to fill in in this section. We're going to talk about packaging and structuring your files in this section, in the OOP section. But make sure that your folder structure looks like this. In the source folder, you have the lectures package and the lectures has two packages, part one basics and part two OOP. Now in part two OOP, I want you to right click and then create a new application as we've gotten used to. So new skull class, I'm going to create this O basics class. I'm going to make this an object, of course, and hit OK, and then extends app. In this section, we are going to learn about what object means and what extending another class means. So let's write our simplest class. I'm going to write a class here outside the object implementation because class definitions can sit on the top level code. So here it is. Class, and I'm going to create a class called person. And this is it, folks you've created a class. To instantiate this class person, we're just going to assign it to a val. Let's say we create a val called person and the instantiation of a class is with the operator new and then the name of the class. So congrats folks, you have instantiated a class. And if I print line the person val, I'm going to see something very weird in the console, but let me switch to my presentation mode so they can see more clearly. So right click and run. And we have this very weird string representation. We're going to learn about string representations a little bit later. Don't worry about it. This is how the JVM naturally represents things. And we are going to learn prettier string representations very, very shortly. Now, before we move on, I'm going to say that I'm not going to stress too much about what a class is and about what instantiation means. I'm going to assume that you know this from other languages. But the short story is that a class organizes data and behavior, that is code, and instantiation means concrete realizations in memory, that is actual memory spaces, that conform to the code and the data structure that the class describes. Now, that being said, let's move on and let's create a little more complex class than this simple person class. Let's say the person actually has a name and an age. So the way that I'm going to write is I'm going to pass in parameters to this class person. I'm going to say name string and age int. This is how we pass parameters to a class. This resembles the way that we pass parameters to functions, but in this case, this syntax has a different meaning. This right over here is called a constructor. A constructor says basically that every single instance of person must be constructed by passing in a name and an age. And the compiler is so eager to tell us that and it says unspecified value parameters, name and age. So let's pass some values to it. And let's say John and age 26. And now the compiler is happy because this person is correctly constructed. Now, let's say I want to print to the console this person's age. Now, the way that you would do that in other languages would be to, to write something like person.age. But in Scala, the compiler will complain and it will say cannot resolve symbol age. And this is the first lesson that I want you to take away. And that is the fact that age is a class parameter, but it's not a class member that you can access with the dot operator. So basically class parameters are not fields. 
So class parameters from the constructor and class fields that you can access are two different things. Now the way that you would convert a class parameter to a field would be to add the val or var keyword before the parameter. And now as you see, the compiler is happy and the person.h can be printed out to the console. And if I run this, I'm probably going to see the value of 26, of course. So remember, class parameters and class fields are two different things, and the way that you convert parameters to fields is to add the keyword val or var to the class parameters. Now, it's not always the case that you would want to convert all class parameters to fields, of course. So make sure you get this right. Now, we know that classes are basically blueprints that describe the way that things look like, that is data, and the way things work, and that is functionality, or we call it behavior. So we've talked about class data with parameters and fields, let's add some actual functionality. So let's expand this person class by, I'm actually going to move this comment above, and I'm going to open and close curly braces. The curly braces over here are the delimiters to the class's body. Now the body here is not an expression per se, but it defines the implementation of this class. And the block of code inside can have basically everything, including uh, val and var definitions, if I say val x equals two, um, they can have function definitions, we call them methods, we're gonna talk about them very, very shortly. They can have expressions, we can have other definitions, for example, packages and other classes and more complex stuff, so don't need to worry about it for now. And the value of the code block, this guy, is ignored because this guy is only the implementation of this class. But remember that you can do anything inside this block that you can do in a block expression. Now, before we move on, I want to tell you a couple of things. So, first of all, the value definitions or the var definitions inside the class implementations are fields. So for example, I declared a value x equals two, I can actually use that as a field. So if I right click and run this, I'm going to see the value two printed to the console. But also notice that before the value two here, the value four was printed before. So this guy was also evaluated and that is because at every instantiation of the class person, this whole block of code will be evaluated. That is, every single expression within and all side effects, for example, this print line, will be executed. Okay, so you've learned quite a bit about what you can do inside a block implementation of a class. You've learned that you can create vals and vars and that you can evaluate expressions. Now I promised you that we would dive into defining functions, so let's do that. So let's define a function that greets someone else. So I'm going to greet somebody with a name. And this guy will return unit. As I don't want a too fancy implementation, I'm just going to print line. And I'm going to use an s interpolated string. And I'm going to say dollar name says hi name. This function, because it's defined inside a class definition, is called a method but you know this already. And if I actually call this method, I would use the dot notation that we used for accessing fields as well. So we can say person dot greet, and then I'm gonna pass in a parameter, say Daniel. All right, so if I right click and run this, let's see what happens. Daniel says, hi Daniel. Well, this is kind of wrong because we wanted John to say, hi Daniel. And it makes total sense because name and name are two different names and they all resolve to the name parameter for the method. But we want the name to be this person's name. So of course the way that we would do that is to use this dot name. You've probably seen the keyword this or the implied use of either self or this or some other form of accessing this instance's field. But notice that the name is not a class field, but it's still available within the class definition. So this dot name will refer to the name parameter of class person, whether the name is an actual field or not. So if I right click and run this, I'm going to see John says hi Daniel, which is 
the implementation that I want. You've also likely seen this in other languages, but whenever you do not need the keyword this to kill ambiguity, the use of fields and parameters actually implies the use of this. So if I say a method greet with no parameters and that returns unit and just prints line an S interpolated string which says hi I am dollar name what this actually says is hi I am dollar this dot name but this is implied so whether I say name or this dot name this is not really relevant because if I say dollar name it's always implied to be this person's either parameter or field but if I have a method with a parameter with the same name then the dollar name here or any use of the name word will refer to the parameter instead of the class's field or parameter but right now I've just gotten us into a new topic which is the topic of overloading Overloading means defining methods with the same name, but different signatures. Overloading is allowed in most languages, including Scala. The compiler is not confused if you say person greet Daniel or person dot greet. The compiler will then know how to create a program that knows which method to call later. The only time the compiler is confused is if you supply two methods with the same parameter lists, but returning different things. So if I say def greet that returns an int, for example, and returns the value 42, then the compiler will complain because if you call the method greet, the compiler will not know which method you actually want to call. Do you want to call this one or this one? And the compiler says greet is already defined in the scope. So this is not overloading. Overloading means supplying the methods with the same name, but different signatures. Different signatures means different numbers of parameters or parameters of different types coupled with possibly different return types here at the end, but this alone is not subject to overloading. All right, so we've discussed classes, parameters, fields, methods, construction, and overloading. Let's talk about multiple constructors. or overloading constructors. Now we said at the beginning that this class's definition right over here is called a constructor because it allows the construction of instances right over here. Now in many languages for the same class we can supply many constructors and in Scala we allow that too by using def this. So say for example I have an auxiliary constructor that initializes the age with zero so it only takes the name as a parameter and it calls the primary constructor with this, with name, and zero. So the implementation of the auxiliary constructor with only the name parameter actually calls the primary constructor with also the keyword this with two parameters. Now, although this is pretty cool, the frustration with auxiliary constructors is that the implementation of a secondary constructor has to be another constructor and nothing else. So if, for example, I define a another constructor with no parameters and I initialize this with, say, John Doe, right? This is the only implementation that an auxiliary constructor can have, which is to call another constructor, primary or secondary. Now, this limitation makes the auxiliary constructors quite impractical because they're only used in practice for default parameters. For example, I declared this auxiliary constructor just to omit the age parameter. So this could be more easily solved by supplying a default parameter to the actual class definition. So we won't actually need this new auxiliary constructor. So notice that default parameters actually work for constructors as well. All right, so let's take a small break now and resume exercises in the next video.